Well, good afternoon and welcome back from lunch. Hopefully you got a bite to eat. Um, I'm obviously not Jonathan Newfeld. Jonathan hurt his back um, and will not be able to moderate today, so I'm pitching in. Um, I don't want to take a lot of time because I think you'll be thrilled to hear from Dr. Leff. He's a professor of medicine at Johns Hopkins University and uh, School of Medicine, and he's going to be talking about transforming care delivery with hospital at home and basically the pioneer of this whole effort that we're now hearing about through CMS. So Dr. Lev, go for it. Thanks, Kathy. And it's great to be here today. Really appreciate uh, the invitation and the opportunity to talk about hospital at home and also a little bit about uh, other home and community-based care delivery models. So the, um, my hypothesis, my, the thesis, and what I'd like to convince you of over the next bit of time is that hospital at home care will be mainstreamed into the US healthcare delivery system. I'm much more certain of that than I was when I first started putting this statement on a slide some years ago, but I'm, I'm reasonably convinced uh, of it now. And let me, what I'll do is take you through the story of hospital at home development and uh, implementation and hopefully getting to scale in hospital at home. So I started my career in thinking about home-based medical care when I was a junior and senior resident in the primary care internal medicine training program at Hopkins. Uh, that program is based at what is now Hopkins Bayview Medical Center, what was then Francis Scott Key Medical Center and what had been just before that, the Baltimore City Hospitals. We were sitting and still sit in Southeast Baltimore in, um, kind of a urban-ish uh, setting. And we had a program that uh, we primary care residents picked up as junior and senior residents to provide home-based primary care at home for older adults who were frail, who couldn't get to the doctor's office and our general medicine residents and fellows, geriatric fellows and geriatrics faculty provide ongoing longitudinal care in their home by making house calls. And in that experience, a number of times when I was a resident and then as a fellow and attending, we would have situations where our older frail people got ill, acutely ill. So MIs and pneumonia and episodes of heart failure. And a number of folks would refuse to come to the hospital uh, and we would think, you know, is there a better way to take care of these people in something like a hospital at home rather than kind of trying to string together acute hospital services? So that's kind of why we started to think about hospital at home. I think my work doing home-based primary care really helped me think about how to provide care in people's homes. It taught me a little bit more about being a guest in someone's home. It taught me that providing care in people's homes sort of equaled out the power differential that we sometimes see when people come to see us in our high-tech medical centers. Uh, and it really got me to think a lot about care in the home. So, you know, based on that experience, I started to think about home-based care. So being a good uh, reader of literature, I decided to go to the literature and see what, what is home-based care. And it was something of a mess. It's a very messy literature, uh, partly because there are only so many words in the English language you could use to describe these various care mo models, but I found the literature confusing and chances are if you don't know much about this space, uh, you may find it confusing and sometimes people who even know this space can find it confusing. So let me just give you a very brief mental map of home-based care. So starting off on the left, you see a box for informal services. So this would be personal care services. So, uh, uh, I'm getting older, I'm becoming a bit more frail. It's harder for me to take a bath or get up out of bed. And you know, my wife who still loves me, I think, will help me with those activities. And I don't pay her money, but she does a lot of that care. And there are probably about 10 or 15 million people in the US who are informal caregivers. If I don't have someone at home with me and I need help with those activities, I may actually need to pay someone to come into my home to do those things. Those are called formal personal care services. About 2 million people will pay for those services. Uh, and someone comes to your home and helps you with those things for however much time you want them to spend with you. Moving a bit over to the right, we have skilled home health care. So the Medicare skilled home health care benefit, it's actually a part A Medicare benefit. It's provided in 
episodes of 30 days of care, the person needs to be homebound by Medicare definitions. And the thing about this to get qualified for this service for skilled home health care, someone has to have what CMS calls, what Medicare calls a skilled need. That is something that has to be done by a skilled person, a physical therapist, an occupational therapist, a nurse. Those are skilled people. If, if I help my wife with an activity, I am not a skilled person uh, as a lay person. And CMS pays for that care on a prospective payment based on an incredibly complex formula. And about three and a half million people avail themselves of that service in the Medicare program each year. So about 10% of Medicare beneficiaries per year. Moving over a little bit more to the right, you have home-based primary care, and there are some variations on that that have been springing up. Uh, and this is like the program I described before, where physicians, nurse practitioners go out to the home and provide ongoing longitudinal care in the home to usually older adults. And then all the way over on the right, sort of the most acute kind of care you can provide in the home is hospital at home, and we'll talk a bit more about that. But as you go from left to right, you go from lower acuity to higher acuity care, you go from more of a chronic care construct towards an acute care construct. And you move from models where, you know, in the informal service model, there's little or no physician or nurse practitioner or advanced provider involvement to models where there's a high level of that. So this was the basic mental map I kind of got into my head earlier in my career. Uh, and if any of you have been following this space, you know that this place is just absolutely exploding. And I apologize here for a little bit of formatting that got a little bit messed up when we went to the bigger screen. But, you know, now you have uh, inserted into this early mental map a whole lot of new models that are moving into the home and community-based space. So in addition to home-based primary care, up in the upper left here, you have home-based palliative care. So for folks with palliative care needs who are home limited or for whom it's difficult to get out of the home, there are companies now that will go out and provide sort of palliative care as an add-on service, as a co-management service to primary care. You've had a lot of in the development of transitional and post-acute care programs over the last two or three, two and a half decades. You now have companies and entities that will provide urgent care at home and on the phone. So you can order a house call on the phone now in certain places around the country. And if you've been following the recent uh, announcements by Amazon, the service that they offer to all their employees is going to be made available on a nationwide basis. So you can get a doc on the phone anytime to uh, assess you and tell you whether you need to be, uh, can be taken care of at home with someone delivering a drug to your doorstep in a few minutes, or whether you need to head to an urgent care or an ED. There's been a lot of development of emergency medical service based models, EMS based models. So mobile integrated health and community uh, paramedicine have become more common and used not just to take people from home to a hospital e emergency department, but also to do, actually do and engage in case management services uh, and the like. Uh, you also have uh, coming down here to the lower left, formal personal care services, what I'll call formal personal care services plus. So I mentioned before informal personal care you know, you could have someone come into your home and provide, you know, give you a bath or help cook a meal or something like that. Those services are not always the easiest to obtain. Usually they're run through, through regular home health agencies. You usually have to buy about four hours of care at a time. You never know who's going to show up to your house to do the care. And now there are companies who will provide almost an Uber kind of service for personal care services. So you can go onto your phone and say, I would like a Mandarin speaking woman to come to my home tomorrow at 12 noon, stay for an hour and give me a bath. And you may, and you'll be able to get that if you live in certain cities now in the country, especially West Coast and sort of the higher tech kinds of cities. You're also seeing interventions uh, that I'll call uh, function focused interventions, function and functional impairment, that is the inability to do basic activities like bathing and dressing are major driver of cost. So if you have people with equal degrees of, of chronic illness, someone with functional impairment will cost on average three to five times as much in terms of health service utilization. So inter interventions like something called Capable developed by Sarah Zanton here at Hopkins, a time limited intervention of a nurse OT and handyman to actually help people improve function. And it actually does. 
uh, which is remarkable because there are very few interventions that actually improve physical function. And then a whole lot going on now in the realm of telemedicine and sensors and the development of the AI to support uh, all of that. So a lot is going on in this space. It is expanding and getting disrupted uh, very frequently, I would say at least on a, a weekly or monthly basis, major, major shakeups going on, a lot of money being invested in the space. So let's come back now to thinking about hospital at home and why I think we need that. I alluded to it a little bit before, let me just go into a little bit more depth. So this is a gentleman named Walter. Uh, I've been carrying Walter around for, for many years now. He was a gentleman who uh, lived in Southeast Baltimore. He was being followed in our home-based primary care program. Uh, he had multiple chronic conditions like obstructive pulmonary disease and heart failure and arthritis. And, uh, and he was, had a lot of functional impairment. He was homebound. You could see he's wearing his little oxygen cannula here uh, around his nose, his cat sitting in his lap. And um, you know, Walter uh, never liked going to the hospital. And his gripes with the hospital were things like, I can't get my breathing treatments on time, so I end up on a ventilator. It would happen. So the food stinks. Actually, he was a bit more graphic about that, but didn't want to involve the FCC in our discussion today. He said no one uh, would talk with him in the hospital, so it was a fairly lonely experience for him. Uh, one time he got confused and tied down. That is, he developed incident delirium and acute confusional state, which is common among older adults in the hospital. And he was physically restrained and he never forgot that experience. He talked about that until the day he died. It was utterly humiliating for him. Uh, he said, and I know this only happens in Baltimore, but he'd always come home with a completely new set of medicines. And you would think MedRec in the age of Epic and other EMRs uh, is easy and it is not. And that problem has not been solved. Uh, and one day uh, Walter got sick and we were out making a house call. He clearly clinically had a community acquired pneumonia. We said, Walter, you know, your, your heart rate's up, your oxygen level's a bit low. We really think you need to go to the hospital. And he looked at us and I'll, I really won't ever forget this. He said, listen, I am so sick and tired of you geniuses from Hopkins. You're great doctors, you run a crappy hotel. I'm not going to the hospital. This is your problem, do something about it. And that really got us to be thinking about developing hospital at home, those kinds of experiences. And so it got us to think about sort of our first, uh, first model out of the box, which was basically uh, an early hospital at home model where if you start off here on the left, someone would be assessed, usually in the ED, in the emergency department. It doesn't have to be the emergency department, but there are some advantages to that and happy to talk about that in the Q&A. So someone is in the ED, they are acutely ill, they meet threshold criteria to be admitted to the hospital. They have a hospital at home qualifying condition and we can talk about that in a minute. Uh, and they're not so sick that they need an ICU or are gonna need an extremely high tech oriented stay in the hospital and they agree to be taken care of in the hospital at home. Uh, they're taken home. Sometimes it's an ambulance, sometimes it's an ambulette, depending on their condition. They could sometimes even go home in the car they came in on. And then they get care at home. They get what they would have gotten in the hospital. So what does that mean? It means they get physician visits. Initially, they were all in person. A lot of models now are doing virtual physician visits. They get nursing care at home in person. They get the kinds of treatments they would get at home. So IV medicines and IV fluids and the full range of respiratory therapies. And you can do diagnostics at home, blood tests, basic radiography, echo, ultrasound, all sorts of things that you can now do in the home. And then that person's taken care of, they get better, and then they're discharged. Only this time it's the discharge from the home hospital at home unit to their home. And you can do med rec at the kitchen table. So it's not complete science fiction. And when you prescribe uh, post-acute physical therapy, you can have a really informed discussion with the physical therapist because you've actually seen the patient in their home. So in this slide, let me just cover about 25 years worth of work in one slide. So initially back when we started on this uh, in Baltimore back in 1994, we had to determine who and what to treat in hospital at home. So what conditions could we treat? What are the criteria to, to pick the right patients? We did a lot of work in claims. We did a lot of chart review studies and we came up with 
you know, reasonable clinical criteria to identify patients who could be treated at home based on the context of those illnesses, based on our experience in providing medical care in the home. And the conditions that we started out with were pneumonia, community-acquired pneumonia, exacerbations of heart failure, exacerbations of obstructive pulmonary disease, and cellulitis. Uh, the next thing we did is we did some early studies after developing some eligibility criteria to choose the right patients. We did some early studies to see if patients would want this kind of care. You know, if we build it, would patients come? And even in the late 90s, when we described this model to people who were eligible for hospital at home on the day after they were admitted to the actual hospital and described the model, the majority of folks said that if someone had come up to me in the ED and said, would you like to go home if we can provide this kind of care, most of them said yes. We then did in the late 90s, some early pilot studies at Hopkins. It took us a while to get those studies through our research boards, our IRBs. Uh, and we did basically a case series of patients, about 20 patients or so, and basically proved that if we provided acute hospital care at home, people's heads would not explode. They would actually have a good clinical experience. Uh, we, it was feasible to provide this care and it actually was less costly than typical hospital care by about 20 or 30%. We then um, went to CMS, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Studies uh, Services. Those are the folks who manage the Medicare program. Their offices are in Baltimore, so it's a short ride for us. And we went to them starting in the mid late 90s and asking them for a payment mechanism, a payment waiver to provide hospital care and get paid for it. So most of you know that when someone's admitted to the traditional hospital, that hospital is paid for on what's called a DRG basis, a diagnosis related group, basically a fixed payment with some accountability for severity of illness, but a fixed payment based on the admitting, uh, based on the diagnosis of what the patient was treated for. And we went to CMS and said, you know, you should do this for hospital at home. And they said, now nah, we really don't wanna do that because we think by the year 2000, everyone in the Medicare program will be in a managed care program, i.e. what we now call Medicare Advantage. And within Medicare Advantage, those programs have the flexibility to do what they want with the healthcare dollar. And they said, you know what, you should go to Medicare Advantage plans and do a larger study of hospital at home. And so we didn't really have a choice and that's what we did. So we uh, found a bunch of managed care, Medicare managed care programs around the country in addition of uh, Veterans Affairs Hospital and veteran, the Veterans Affairs Hospitals Health Centers are good for this because they operate under a globally budgeted system. So they also have freedom to do what they want with the healthcare dollar. And we actually did a national demonstration and evaluation study of hospital at home, which we published in 2005. Uh, we'll tell you about those results in a moment. Since that time, we've been involved in a lot of dissemination activities. I'll talk about that. And then in 2014, in collaboration with colleagues at Mount Sinai in New York, we did a Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation demonstration study of hospital at home. And I'll tell you about that in a moment. And then after that, we've been working a lot on implementation and uh, payment issues related to hospital at home. So these are the results from our national demonstration study, which we did in three Medicare Advantage plans and a VA medical center. Uh, and published this in Annals of Internal Medicine back in 05. And what we found was that hospital at home, that first of all, people opted in for hospital at home. They wanted this kind of care. Uh, so 61% chose hospital at home when offered to them. That may not sound like a high number, but imagine you're an 80 year old person in the ED with an acute pneumonia and the ED doctor has said, you know, you need to be admitted to the hospital, Mr. Jones, Mrs. Johnson. Um, and then someone else comes up to you a few minutes later and says, hey, we know you need the hospital. How about we take you home? We're gonna take care of you in this model you've never heard of. You'll be taken care of by people you've never met. And by the way, this care is being provided by your friendly neighborhood Medicare Advantage plan, which has every reason to treat you right and do well. And by the way, please sign this 10 page single space consent form because the pointy headed people from Hopkins wanna do research on this. Even in that context, 61% of folks opted in. It was high quality care by any quality metric uh, we could measure, uh, both uh, illness specific and more general health quality measures better than in the hospital. There were fewer complications. We had a 76% reduction in incident delirium. We had lower mortality rates. We had less 
uh, adverse drug reactions and, uh, and the like. We had better patient and caregiver, uh, family and caregiver, patient and family caregiver uh, experience in hospital at home compared to the hospital. Lower costs of care by about 20 to 30%, depending on the system. Less caregiver stress. So we would never require family to do care, but we still thought that there might be some stress involved in just having someone sick at home. And, and we went out to measure that. And we found less caregiver stress when caregivers had their loved one at home than the hospital. And as you might imagine, there's a fair bit of stress involved in parking uh, at, at hospitals and medical centers, and uh, they didn't have to do that in hospital at home. We had better functional outcomes and also high provider satisfaction as well. Um, I mentioned before the CMMI demonstration of hospital at home. This was done at Mount Sinai, New York between 2014 and 2017. Uh, we, um, uh, in that demonstration, you had to propose to CMS a new model, which was hospital at home, and then a new payment. And what we, uh, what we came up with was the idea that in the, during the demonstration, CMS would pay fee for service Medicare for the care, and that we would use the data to develop a bundled a payment approach for the future. And that's exactly what we did. But you can see in these data, that the outcomes for hospital at home were paralleled very much what we saw in our own national demonstration uh, years before. So the length of stay, which usually tends to be lower for hospital at home than controls was the same thing here. Readmissions were cut in half from about 16% to about eight and change percent. We had um, uh, reductions in uh, transfer to skilled nursing facilities. So. Uh, hospital controls went to SNFs after hospital care over 10% of the time, less than 2% of the time for hospital at home. Slightly higher use of uh, skilled home health care, which is not unexpected. Uh, better overall care experience rating for hospital at home and also lower costs of care. So those uh, results replicated again. If you look at hospital at home in the context of meta-analysis, so hospital at home, while it has not been uh, studied extensively in the US apart from our work in Baltimore and the work at Mount Sinai and some work done by a colleague, David Levine at the Brigham who recently conducted the first US RCT, randomized controlled trial of hospital at home. Most of the studies have been done overseas in countries with single payer systems where the economic incentives line up. So countries like the UK, and Italy and Israel and New Zealand and Australia. And when you look at, and there have been several Cochrane reviews of hospital at home as well. This is a meta-analysis done by uh, uh, Gideon Kaplan in Australia a few years back. Uh, there were nearly 60 randomized controlled trials that he found of hospital at home. And when you put them together, you had a 21% reduction in mortality with a number needed to treat of 50. That is, if you treat 50 people in hospital at home compared to the hospital, you will prevent one death and a 24% reduction in readmissions. Just to be clear, if we had a drug that had a 21% reduction in mortality with a number needed to treat of 50, I absolutely would not be talking to you right now, right? I would be sitting on the beach in the Caymans counting the billions of dollars because that would be a blockbuster drug. But I think we all know that health service delivery is often much more challenging in terms of implementation and scale than other, other paths, such as the pharmaceutical path or the device pathway. So what did Walter think? Walter loved hospital at home. He said, I definitely would have ended up on a breathing machine if I had been in the hospital. He loved the attention from the nurses and having the doc see him at home. And he didn't have to worry about his cat. And my fellow was very happy because whenever Walter got admitted, I always always make make one of my fellows take home his cat. So my fellow was also very happy. So our goal over time has been to move, try and move from research. And this picture is of the original Hopkins hospital building, uh, this dome up here, which is the corporate logo for Hopkins. This is where William Osler sat in the late 19th century and wrote his famous uh, textbook of uh, internal medicine, but we really wanted to move out of the ivory tower. So, you know, we've been working to broaden awareness and create interest in hospital at home over the last 15 plus years. Uh, we've been working on dissemination of the model into various sectors of, of the health service delivery environment. 
Uh, we've done some provision of technical assistance uh, and we've advised some new commercial entities in the space. And we've been working a lot on payment and policy issues. So one thing to think about in the context of hospital at home is, you know, once you have the ability to do acute hospital at home, that is take someone who's acutely ill, who shows up in the ED, take them directly home and provide their hospital care at home, you can start riffing off of that set of competencies to do a bunch of other things, which are also substitutive of providing care in facilities. And a lot of this work grew out of the work that we did during the CMMI demo at Mount Sinai. We had originally intended in that research and in that demo to just do what we call acute substitute of hospital at home, that is ED to home. But we found that once we created that, we could do other things at home. So we could do what we call transfer or completing hospitalization at home. So someone comes to the hospital, they're really sick, they're admitted to the hospital, they get a little bit better, they still need hospital care, but now you can take them home and complete their hospitalization at home. Transfer, much in the same way that people get transferred in the hospital, say from an intensive care unit setting to a typical medicine ward or med surge ward transfer. As long as someone still needs hospital level care, why not do it at home and free up a hospital bed? You can do an observation stay at home. And then if someone stays in their observation status for more than two midnights, you can transfer them into your hospital at home. We found that during the CMMI demo that there were older adults who were really should have been enrolled in hospice or really were in the palliative care uh, uh, sort of trajectory of their healthcare journey. Uh, they would come to the hospital, they would be acutely ill with a pneumonia. No one had ever told them that they were facing their mortality. Uh, we would take care of them in hospital at home, have a lot of discussions about advanced directives and often get them into hospice. We also found hospital averse at home. That is people who were really too sick for hospital at home, show up in the ED and were absolutely refusing to go to the hospital and we would sometimes provide care to them. And then another model, rehab at home. So basically skilled nursing facility care at home instead of care post acute care in a skilled nursing facility for people who had a rehab focused skilled nursing facility stay coming up. This all built out at Mount Sinai on a foundation of home-based primary care and that hospital at home acute substitute of care. And now, you know, you even see uh, the development now of something that's not even on the slide, ED at home. You know, so you actually, there are ways to do a lot of emergency department care at home instead of showing up uh, in the ED, a lot of interest in oncology at home. So, you know, one of my goals and the goals of, of people who are in the space is to really mainstream and scale hospital uh, at home. And I think there are a few things that you need to think of uh, in that context. So uh, one major thing to think about is the issue of leadership and culture change in healthcare. So what you see there, that picture of the bicycle, it's kind of a weird thing. You see those gears in the middle. This is a backwards bicycle. And uh, all of you, I don't think I'm gonna take my full time today and, and maybe the Q and A won't either, but in the time that we're gonna give back to you in your life, go on YouTube and just put into the search engine backward bicycle. And you'll see a video, a guy has folks build him this bicycle where when you turn the handlebars to the left, the wheel goes to the right. And the guy thought it would take him about a few hours to learn how to ride this bicycle. And it took him about six or eight months, right? And he uses it as a metaphor for the challenge of changing things in any sphere that are very hardwired, where there are very hardwired processes in place, right? You learn how to ride a bicycle, you know how to ride a bicycle, you get on a bicycle, you don't even think about it, you ride the damn bicycle. And I think that's what we see a lot of in healthcare as well. You know, we're used to providing facility-based care, we're used to providing care in clinics, in hospitals, we have designed the system to serve that paradigm. And it gets very hard when you get out of that paradigm. And sometimes even when you're forced out of that paradigm, once the pressures come back a little bit, everyone tries to roll back to the old paradigm, right? So, you know, COVID hit in Baltimore as it did everywhere else. We shifted our clinic from 100% in, uh, in person to 100% virtual. And then as soon as things eased up, leadership just wanted us to come all the way back to in-person care. It's what they were used to doing. It's what the system was designed for. 
the revenue, all of that was designed to go that way. It's hard to change hardwired things, but there is leader, you know, that does take leadership. We're seeing a lot of that kind of leadership now uh, in healthcare. And I think people are starting to recognize that the home and community-based space is something they should be looking at in a big way, but it will still take a lot of work. Another thing for hospital at home, um, what I'll call supply chain challenges. So this is a picture of Times Square in New York during a blizzard. There was a major blizzard about, I don't know, five or six, seven years ago. I happened to be in New York at that time. And they shut down the subway. It was like the first time in decades they had shut down the subway. And what you see here, if any of you have ever lived in New York, you know exactly who this person is. This person is someone who works for a restaurant and is delivering takeout food to someone. And you know that if you live in New York, you could have takeout food delivered at any hour of the day or night through blizzards and hurricanes, and that food will get to your door within 15 minutes. And the challenge is it's much more challenging to get oxygen delivered to a person on time on a sunny day in New York than it is to get, get you know, any ethnic food of your choice uh, delivered through a blizzard. So there are supply chain challenges for hospital at home. There are many entities now really looking at this problem hard who were not looking at it years ago. So you have entities like Cardinal Health and others and, you know, uh, who are really starting to think about logistics and supply chain to support not only hospital at home, but a full home and community-based continuum of care. And I think that's going to get easier over time, but that is a challenge in building out hospital at home programs. Payment is a big deal as well. So um, a few years back in 2015, the MACRA bill was passed by Congress and signed into law, and that was the Medicare and CHIP Reauthorization Act. As part of that, there was something in that bill called the PTAC, the Physician Focused Payment Model Technical Advisory Committee to the Secretary, wherein anyone could propose a new payment model for Medicare in the Medicare program to the Secretary of HHS. Our team from Sinai and myself, we worked on submitting a model to that committee, which was staffed by some very, very smart people that had been appointed by the Secretary. And we basically proposed a bundled payment for hospital at home that would cover the acute episode of hospital at home care, that acute hospital level care, which we proposed a mildly discounted diagnosis related group payment plus the bundled payment to cover the post-acute care for 30 days. Uh, and that proposal was approved by the PTAC sent to the secretary at that time, who was Tom Price. He uh, resigned shortly after our proposal got to his desk. I don't think it had anything to do uh, with us, but more to do with his um, pension for flying first class on commercial, on commercial airline flights. Uh, and then it went to Alex Azar's desk, Secretary Azar's desk, uh, where it sat until he got into his seat. And he declined pretty much all the proposals that came through the PTAC, but he did recommend that CMS continue to talk with us about hospital at home. And those discussions uh, have, been, have been ongoing to the extent that in uh, latter part of 2020, CMS got very interested in hospital at home again. And they actually came up with a hospital-based payment waiver for hospital at home. And the reason they got very interested in this uh, was basically the COVID pandemic. And there was anxiety uh, at the federal level that as we were edging into the winter that hospitals would lack capacity. And they were trying to do, you know, use a bunch of tools, create a bunch of alternatives so that hospitals would not face that kind of capacity crunch. So they created a hospital-based payment waiver for hospital at home. Uh, what this hospital-based payment waiver provides is that for hospitals that can prove to CMS through a fair, actually, quite honestly, a fairly straightforward and fairly easy application process, they can prove to CMS that they have the wherewithal to provide hospital at home care. CMS provides a waiver to that hospital to pay a hospital, a full hospital DRG payment for hospital at home care. Uh, so that waiver went in on November 25th, and as of last week or the week before, 110 hospitals had applied for and gotten that waiver from hospital from CMS. So that's about somewhere between two and three percent of U.S. hospitals. Uh, that is actually starting to edge towards you know an early adopter uh, place on the dissemination of innovation curve. 
So this has really been quite a jolt in the arm for hospital at home. Uh, we've gotten a lot of attention from leadership at the federal level and the program has been going very well. And I think uh, they're quite pleased with it. And I think that's really been a, a tremendous jolt in the arm for the program. Uh, with this, it's interesting that now, you know, issues that we in our own very small hospital home community have been thinking about for years are now bubbling up. So one thing that we've, that we've always been in a sort of a strange position is, is like, under what regulatory and accreditation process should hospital at home live? Is it, should it live under a hospital regulatory framework? Should it live under an ambulatory regulatory framework? It's really been in regulatory purgatory for a while because, you know, it hasn't been a big thing. Uh, you know, the the, uh, you know, the, the quality and regulatory bodies like CMS and like the Joint Commission and like NCQA and others, you know, haven't really known what to do with hospital home because it wasn't a real, quite honestly, a business opportunity for some of the accreditation types of bodies. They haven't really thought about it all that much. Now they're starting to pay attention. And, you know, my own view is that it probably needs its own category, you know, that would allow it to adopt and adapt uh, you know, good things from both hospital and home-based care and, you know, find a regulatory framework that works in a way that makes sense. Uh, I think another big development over the last few years is actually the development of commercial entities in the hospital at home space. So there are now at least three commercial entities that are, uh, you know, often collaborating and working with health systems and hospitals around the country to help them scale hospital at home. And I think that's a very good thing. You know, you to scale this, you do need capital, you do need people waking up every day and making this their, their job. Uh, and I think that's also been a good development for the field. And then something else we've been working on is to create a community of of hospital at home programs. So about 18 months ago with support from uh, our funder, the John A. Hartford Foundation of New York, we created what we call the hospital at home user group. And about 18 months ago, it was really the currently existing 20, 25 programs that are around the country that were doing hospital at home. Uh, we came together, we decided to share best practices. We developed some work groups focused on the development of program standards uh, and quality measures, anticipating a future where uh, you know CMS and the Joint Commission, et cetera, would want to understand how they should approach hospital at home. Another uh, work group working on payment and regulatory issues. We're doing collaborative research and collaborative advocacy. Uh, and since the CMS waiver has come up, the interest in the program and in the model has exp exploded. And now we have at least 50 programs that are members and then another 100, 150 that are what we call affiliates. So until they take care of their first patient, we we bring them in as affiliates, but that's been going quite well uh, also. And then there's not only a US community of hospital at home, but a world community. So uh, the world, uh, the next, the uh, every, we in Madrid in 2019 was the first world hospital at home Congress. We were expecting about a hundred people to show up and we got about 450 people come to that meeting. Uh, the next meeting is in was supposed to be in Vienna, but it will be virtual coming up on uh, April 19th. Uh, and if you're interested in that, just Google World Hospital at Home Congress and register. It's a great program. You'll hear from programs around the world. Uh, and there are some really, really cool things going on in, in Spain and Australia and uh, all sorts of places, not just the US. So a lot to learn from our brothers and sisters around the world. And then just to say that, you know, with culture, uh, with leadership and culture change, you really can make things happen. So in the, uh, the item on the left is a full page ad from Mount Sinai that appeared in a full page ad in the New York Times about 2015. And this is a picture of uh, the Great Lawn at Central Park looking to the west side of New York City of Manhattan. And the ad reads, if our beds are filled, it means we failed. And if you read the small print, basically it says, you know, Sinai is trying to keep people out of the hospital. And one of the tools that they are using is hospital at home. This is when they first started their program. Uh, and, you know, 
at the beginning, I think even my colleagues from Sinai might have said that this was probably a little bit more marketing than, than, you know, than true change in the culture. But over time, it clearly is true change in the culture. And their, their hospital at home program has, ex has expanded. Other means to keep people out of the hospital have expanded. Uh, when they tore down a 900 bed hospital in Midtown, New York, instead of replacing it with 900 beds, they replaced it with 300 beds. And they said, you know, hospital at home is one of the tools we're going to use to make that happen. Uh, the picture on the right is the title of a paper written by a colleague, Michael Montalto, from uh, Melbourne, Australia. In the mid 1990s, the health authority in uh, uh, in Victoria State, where Melbourne uh, sits, decided to pay for hospital at home care at exactly the same rate that they pay for hospital care, kind of like what CMS did with their uh, initial payment waiver. Uh, and what their own health authority um, assessed a few years later is that had they not had to do, had they not done that, they would have had to have built another 500 bed hospital in Melbourne. And it costs, depending on where you build a hospital in the US, it costs between two and $5 million to capitalize a single hospital at home bed. Right, if you do, if you build a bed in San Francisco, it has to be earthquake proof, it's very expensive. So if you have a 500 bed hospital at 2 million per bed, that's a billion dollars of avoided cost, of avoided fixed cost that you're building. Not even to mention the fact that once you build the thing, you have to start filling it with, with people in the beds. Otherwise, you know, you, you, don't make your, you don't make your business model. So things can really change. The other thing I mentioned early in the talk and just to put out here is I, I really start to, I do, I work not only in the context of hospital at home, but I think a lot about home-based primary care and other home-based models. And I think what we have now is the fact that hospital at home is really just one component of a full home-based medical care continuum, right? You have models like home-based primary care and home-based integrated medical and social care. You have models of home-based primary care co-management, a lot of entities entering that space. We mentioned home-based palliative care, uh, rehabilitation at home, community paramedicine. And these models, you know, under the right set of conditions could now be put together to really provide a full continuum of home-based medical care, start to link that up with <clears throat> long-term social supports. And you can really see things change. And I think that is the exciting thing to think about uh, for the future. So uh, final slide, I'm reasonably convinced that hospital at home care will be mainstreamed into US healthcare delivery. I don't know what the lag is. That, is, that I find is the hardest thing to predict uh, in healthcare is how long change takes, but um, things go slow until they go fast and they've really been going fast over the last year or so. So I'll stop there uh, and I think I'm under time, if anything. So I think we'll have uh, time for questions. And Kathy, take it away. Yeah, awesome. There are a whole bunch of questions. And I am still amazed that you started this back in the 90s. Um, so the first question is, as an ER doctor, it is most frustrating to see so many bounce backs who would do so much better in hospital at home. How can we best work across disciplines to make this attractive to payers? Yeah, it's a great question. And so first of all, uh, I, I really appreciate the fact that 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 question is coming from uh, an emergency medicine physician. Uh, our, our, our experience, uh, although it's gotten a lot easier, I think that one of the key uh, bits of culture change that needs to happen is not only with leadership uh, and not only with service delivery, but the emergency medicine physicians and the emergency, emergency provider community in general is a critical, critical node for the success of hospital at home, right? Uh, so if, you know, when, when I talk with hospitals that are thinking about the model, one thing I always emphasize to them is that you must, absolutely must have your emergency medicine colleagues on board with this because if they don't, it, because if they are not on board, they can, you know, it, the they could throw out the baby with the bathwater, right? Because if, if you cannot recruit patients from the ED, sorry, that's just my, my cat entering my room. Um, if you, if you do not have, uh, you know, if the ED does not want to admit patients to hospital at home, the model cannot work. So, you know, in terms of encouraging payers, I think the issue for, uh, you know, emergency medicine, medicine physicians, internal medicine physicians, surg surgical physicians, 
surgeons is to, you know, talk with their leadership and tell them that this is something you would like to see, because I do think it can make a difference for the problem, you know, that you raise in the context of readmissions and bounce backs uh, and the like. Right, next question. Could you please compare the patient financial costs of hospital at home versus skilled nursing facility acute care versus long-term acute care hospital? Is there a stratification process to help providers decide which care setting is the best for each patient type? Or is this a shell game of just moving the patient to shift the costs? Yeah, it's not really a shell. I don't think it's a shell game because I think these models are different. So, you know, an LTAC, a long-term acute care hospital, is not the target population for hospital at home as currently conceived and currently uh, envisioned. I think of hospital at home as a substitute for traditional hospital care. Uh, skilled nursing facility care, different from acute hospital care. And there are uh, models of hospital at home type care that can substitute for a skilled nursing facility care. So I think uh, on that slide where I, I talked about that platform, that set of, of models, we had that box for rehabilitation at home. So that I think of as a skilled nursing facility substitutive model. So that's, that's so not really a shell game, but truly a substitution for that piece of the care continuum. Hospital at home substituting for hospital care. LTAC is a very difficult and challenging environment. And I think one thing that could happen is that over time, as hospital at home gets implemented more widely, hospital at home could easily extend its delivery to substitute for long-term acute care hospital stay. So for instance, many people in LTACs are on ventilators, respiratory, uh, you know, uh, artificial respirators, ventilators on a chronic basis. If you go to France, France has a very robust hospital at home program, sort of a full continuum. I think in France, they have 50,000 people in the country on home ventilators, right? We don't have anywhere, <clears throat> anything close to that on a proportional basis here in the US. So I think they're just different models and different pieces of the hospital at home continuum can substitute for each of those. But a great question. Can you share your thoughts about the scale necessary for this to be successful? Considered the perspective of a rural community hospital with an average daily census of plus or minus 25. Yeah, so the, the, the rural hospital uh, issue is very interesting. And there's been tremendous interest lately from uh, rural states and rural hospitals who are very interested uh, in hospital at home. And I think that hospital at home, um, you know, there are states, I, I know that there is uh, interest in some states where a number of critical access hospitals, rural hospitals have shut down, and they are now thinking at a state level of how can we leverage hospital at home to provide care in our communities, especially where some of our rural hospitals have shut down. And, you know, if you can take some of those rural hospitals and turn them into hospital at home logistic and command centers where you can have a lot of telemedicine video going on and the logistics coordinated from there, I think actually it becomes a very useful model to think about for rural centers. And if you are interested in that, uh, I can tell you that my colleague David Levine at the Brigham and Women's Hospital has been launching some studies of rural hospital at home, easily found on the web, David Levine at Brigham. Uh, and and he's, he'd be a great resource to reach out to. Can you speak to the general eligibility criteria that you might call best practice to include in a hospital at home practice, acute ED yes. to home or discharge from hospital to home? Yeah, so thinking about, you know, who is the right patient for hospital at home is really important. And there's been a little bit of evolution in those criteria as the capability to provide care in the home improves. So, you know, at a basic level, you need to set a floor or a threshold. You don't want to provide hospital at home care to someone who could leave the emergency department with a prescription for an oral antibiotic or advice to increase the dose of their oral diuretic. So they, they must meet leveling criteria, whether that's Milliman criteria or interqual criteria to meet the threshold for hospital admission. And then, you know, the person can't be so sick that they need an ICU, need a very high tech stay or, at a, or at a, are at a high risk of uh, becoming unstable over the course of their hospital stay. And you know, we developed early versions of those criteria back in the mid 90s. They've actually held up reasonably well. And I would say most programs, all programs adopt 
some set of criteria. I think many of those were based on our original work. Um, you know, illnesses have changed, and so those criteria have changed. So, for instance, when our excuse me, when we first developed our criteria in the mid '90s, for instance, HIV was a completely different illness. So, one of our exclusion criteria was if you had HIV and, and you had a pneumonia, you should be taken care of in the hospital. Uh, you know, I would say that doesn't make much sense anymore. You know, HIV is a very different condition. Other things that have caused some shift in uh, eligibility is sort of as uh, technology has gotten a lot better, as remote patient monitoring has improved remarkably, uh, you can now take care of patients who are sicker at home. So when we did our first studies at Hopkins, the most amazing piece of technology we had was a beeper that went beep and an early generation cell phone, which I had to carry on, on my back in, in a small backpack, right? You know, now our, our remote patient monitoring is a whole lot better. Televideo, if you, you know, you can look in on a patient at any time, you can get real-time telemetry. So things that we would have excluded years ago are things that we feel much more comfortable now taking care of. So uh, those will continue to evolve over time. And I would say that over time, I know this may sound hyperbolic, but I think over time, um, the, what we think of now is the traditional acute care hospital will really turn out to be a large ED, ER, OR, operating rooms, and intensive care units. I think everything else will get pushed to the community. And actually, we had ink hints of this during early COVID, right? So in early COVID, when New York City was completely overwhelmed, hospitals actually was even a little bit more striking. They shut down their ORs and they basically became big EDs and ICUs. You know, the hospitals, every unit became an ICU and, you know, it was only the urgent surgeries that were done. Everything else moved out. Maybe not always to the good because you didn't have widely scaled hospital at home to pick up the slack. But I think that's what will happen in the future. Everything else is going to get moved out. Again, I don't know the lag. So this is a great follow-up question to what you were just saying. Have you found that certain homes just cannot accommodate hospital at home because of size or maybe hygiene? If so, on what do you base such decisions? Who makes them? And what do you do when that's the case? Absolutely. Great question. So in addition to assessing medical eligibility, like what is your oxygen saturation, you know, there is a, um, uh, an eligibility based on living situation, right? So someone, you know, we say someone has to be living in a home that has four walls and a roof and water and heating and air conditioning as appropriate to the season and the setting and there has to be a reasonable level of hygiene. And, you know, the hygiene level is usually, you, it's kind of like you know it when you see it. Uh, and for people who don't have that level of housing or environment available, you know, when this gets to scale, there's no reason, and you've seen some programs do this, you know, there's no reason why you can't have this happen in a hotel room, right? It doesn't have to happen in a hospital. Right, so you know, you saw during early phases of the pandemic, some hospitals rent out hotels that had been abandoned because there were no more tourists coming to town. I think that was done in Boston and a few other places. And in those spots, you can provide hospital at home care. It's not your home, but it's a home, and it's not it's not quite the hospital. So I think that's a great question, and that's kind of how it's been been approached. But I think it also gets to the issue of thinking about. Uh, diversity and equity and inclusion in the context of hospital at home. And I would say that that's been an area that's been um, understudied in hospital at home. We actually have some grant funding to start to look at that. You know, you could imagine that um, hospital at home could promote uh, equity in healthcare delivery. You could also hypothesize that it could go the other way. And we just don't have the data on that yet. We're gonna to start, to start to look at it, but it is a great, great thing to start to think about. And I know that over the years, I've been approached by some health systems that have said, you know, we'd really like to try hospital at home, but maybe we wanna focus it on our, um, on our Medicaid population. And I always tell those people, that is the biggest mistake I've ever heard. That is like the stupidest thing I've heard in my life because if something goes wrong, you're gonna end up getting, A, A, it's just a bad approach because it's not an equitable approach to healthcare. B, when something goes wrong, and eventually something will go wrong, 
um, you're going to end up on the front page and, and you'll be accused appropriately of, of providing different levels of care to people, even though the data suggests that in many ways, hospital at home is better care than that which is traditionally delivered in the hospital for certain populations. But that's not a uniform perception. That's, that's a data-driven one. So it's a great question. Terrific question. Here's another interesting question. If you are able to discuss this, has the Johns Hopkins University malpractice carrier increased your premiums as a result of expanding hospital at home? And also, if you can discuss by how much? Yeah, so it's an easy question. The A, I don't know the answer, but the reason I don't know the answer is that after we did our initial studies at Hopkins, because we live in a very fee-for-service world here in Baltimore, actually Maryland's a little bit weird, but it is essentially still fee-for-service, Hopkins has not done hospital at home because they couldn't get paid for it. Now with the waiver from CMS, they are looking to get back into that service line but they, they, they are not in it right now. They're right in the middle of trying to figure out what their next step is. But I can tell you for systems that I know have done hospital at home, I've not heard any, any issues related to um, uh, insurance coverage. And I would hypothesize that um, if anything, insurance premium should go down. I mean, my reading of the medical malpractice literature is that a lot of actions happen because of inadequate or poor communication, you know, more than bad outcome, right? If you have a bad outcome, but the doc or the professionals have been having good communication with people, usually that does not result in a malpractice suit. And I think hospital at home, as well as other home-based uh, delivery models, the risk of malpractice suits actually goes down. And I think that's because when you're a provider, you're a clinician in someone's home, it feels very different than when I'm in the hospital. And I'm a little embarrassed to say it, but I think I'm a better doctor when I'm in someone's home. I do act, I think, a little bit differently. The power differential is, you know, we're on much more of an even playing field. And, um, you know, I can't get away with stuff because it's not my, I'm on their turf. I'm not on my own turf. It, it just feels different. And I think that actually contributes to better communication, uh, you know, people being a little bit more patient with one another, people willing to go the extra mile, all those things that mitigate against those kinds of results. But that'll be, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out over the years. Yeah, great, great perspective on that. How can tele-rehab services be introduced to patients who are discharging home? I own a telepractice company that offers speech therapy services to adults in geriatrics. I would love to provide some services, but I'm unsure how to go about this. Yeah, so, you know, that tele-rehab, whether it's speech therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy, you know, I think those, um, you know, most of the hospital home models have not yet been uh, rehabilitation focused. That's, a, you know, rehabilitation at home or that sniff care provided at home. I think that will become more common. And I think over time, people will end up knocking on your door because the kind of expertise that you have in, in that speech therapy is sometimes very hard, very hard to come by. So I think the, you know, where I would be reaching out in the current environment would be probably with Medicare Advantage plans who, um, you know, uh, who may be contracting for those kinds of services. And they're usually very particular about the kinds of post-acute services, whether it's post-stroke or just simple, you know, post-acute skilled care at home. That would be the first place I would look. But I think over time as rehab at home develops as a model. Remember, there's still no payment model for that. Um, but as payment models evolve for that, I think uh, you'll be in demand. So one of the challenges we see for hospital at home is food, getting folks a healthy diet to support recovery at home. Transition from hospital to home is a focus area for that work. Is there a collaboration between hospital at home and medically tailored meals or similar programs? Yeah, I think that's another area for future development. And the whole food issue is one that came up a lot in the context of health systems trying to figure out how they would perform that function when they, in the context of the CMS waiver, when they had to tell CMS what they would do to get people food. And, you know, what, what most of the programs are doing is, you know, if the patient and his or her family can provide food for themselves, they do that. Uh, and when uh, patients cannot provide food for themselves, then the hospital home program needs to provide food. Uh, and they can do that pretty much however they want. They can, 
They can collaborate with Meals on Wheels. They can collaborate with medical food services. There's really been no set script done for that just yet. I do think one advantage, though, of having folks at home in their own kitchens with their own food stocks putting meals together is it does provide an opportunity to do real assessment and real education around nutrition uh, and how it how it overlaps with the management of chronic, both acute and chronic conditions. So I think there's opportunity there uh, to really improve, improve outcomes. Do you envision a hospital at home that is freestanding, that is one not wedded to a mothership such as at JHU? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question as well. Um, I think freestanding models can happen. Uh, there may be some limitations depending on how payment evolves. So the current CMS payment waiver that's granted to a hospital, right? The waiver is given to a hospital. And that's why the hospital can bill a hospital DRG for the hospital at home admission. In the context of this waiver, the patient has to first touch the hospital. They either have to be seen first in the emergency department or in that transfer model. That is where they spend some time in the hospital, still need hospital level services, and then go home to complete their hospital admission. I think CMS had good reason to start out with this kind of model. I think they were, um, you know, the inference that I drew from how the waiver was uh, written is that there may have been some anxiety that uh, they were anxious that there may be some bad actors who could get into this space and they did not want to uh, risk uh, the safety of beneficiaries in that, in that context. And they thought that hospitals that are doing this would have strong motivation if they are getting paid a hospital level DRG and they know that they're being scrutinized by CMS uh, because they actually have to report data on a very regular basis to CMS as the waiver goes forward, that they would be highly incentivized to provide safe care. You know, how that will go in the future is unclear. Could, could you imagine freestanding hospitals at home uh, competing with uh, traditional hospitals? It's possible, uh, but it could get a little bit interesting and a little bit, a little bit ugly. There are advantages to having patients first seen in the ED, I think, of a hospital. You know, ED has evolved into an amazing uh, acute diagnostic and therapeutic center, right? I mean, when I was in training, someone came to the hospital and needed a CT, you, know, you often didn't get it into the ED. When I attend on the inpatient service now, it's pretty rare for someone to come up from the ED without having their whole body scanned. So, you know, things have changed and the, and the role of the ED has changed. And I think that, um, you know, you may start to see the evolution of ED at home models. And I think as that happens, it'll start to even change the way we think about hospitals and the way hospitals relate to hospital at home models. Um, but, you know, I think there are advantages to um, think about safety. I think there are advantages to presenting this to the public. If, a, if someone receiving the care understands that the hospital at home unit they're being taken care of is actually part of a larger hospital system. It may give them a little bit more confidence that this is a real thing. Uh, so there are many ways to think about it. It's not a settled question. And I think it's one that will evolve over time. I mean, one thing that I've often thought about is imagine a hospital at home unit that covers a whole city agnostic to the health system, but health systems within a geography say, why do each one of us have to build a hospital at home? You know, like, you know, why don't we collaborate around this and share in the provision of service and share in the benefits to our patients and share in, you know, the economic, potential economic advantages of doing that and share in economies of scale by creating one shared unit instead of three or four different units within a specified geography. So I think there, we're going to see all sorts of models evolve as the model continues to move forward, I think. I think this question kind of hits on that. Can you accept the transfer from another e ER? And that sounds like a future model thing. Yeah, I, I think it is. And you're seeing, you know, with uh, among the systems that have gotten the waiver, several of them have several hospitals within the system. So you are starting to see some of those for sure. Would hospital at home be considered a new hospital service requiring Department of Health approval? <laughs> That's a really interesting question. States have taken 
very different approaches to this. <laughs> some states have been a little bit painful uh, and they want to scrutinize it from top to bottom. And some uh, states have said, you know what, if CMS has passed muster on this, we're just going to adopt their stuff and move on because we would like to see this move forward in our jurisdiction as well. So you're seeing a variety of things there. You know, it's the United States of everyone wants to do their own thing kind of thing. There you go. So what standards or guidelines are in place right now to keep the person going into the home uh, to provide care safe? Yeah, I think the, uh, the, uh, the provisions now are that when a hospital applies for and gets the waiver, they basically have to go through an attestation process with CMS that basically, apart from 24-7 one-on-one nursing, they will provide and meet all of the traditional hospital conditions of participation applied to hospital at home. So that's fairly rigorous. And the hospitals also, um, when CMS put the waiver in place, they created two tiers. Tier one was for programs that already had some experience doing hospital at home. And their attestation process was very, very straightforward, very simple. Um, then there were tier two programs, programs that were interested but didn't yet have that experience. And they had to provide a lot more explanation about how they would provide their services. And then uh, to finish the application process, they had direct calls with officials at CMS to attest that they can do these things. And as they implement the program, the tier one programs have to report data every month and the tier two programs have to report data on a weekly basis to CMS. And they have to report unanticipated mortality. And they also have to report what are called escalations in care. That is someone starts care at home in hospital at home. And for whatever reason, the patient says, I wanna to go to the hospital and finish my care there, or the patient deteriorates, that escalation rate is reported to CMS. And when you look in the literature, the escalation rate, you usually see variations between about three and 8%. Right. If the escalation rate is zero, it could be that the program is doing an amazing job. It could also be that they're cherry picking <laughs> and, and you want to make sure that that's not happening. Um, and if the escalation rate is 20 percent, chances are uh, the program has no idea what they're doing or they just quite haven't gotten their logistics down and they need to do a lot more work on safety and quality. Uh, another safety feature is that all the programs are mandated basically to have a safety an internal safety committee. And they also have to attest that someone from the C-suite is overseeing this program and will be personally responsible for it. So those are the kinds of things that they were able to do. But you notice they did not just put out a blanket waiver and say, hospitals, go at it. Anyone can do this, just go at it. They, they at least, um, they did put this, uh, this application process in place and those safety features. Great. So have you seen any use of hospital at home within the ACO model as a win-win collaboration? Yeah, I think it's a great model. Um, you know, ACOs, um, I think it is a, it's potentially a great model for ACOs. I think ACOs sometimes get a little bit anxious because unlike, unlike managed care, they don't always know their population prospectively, it's only a little bit after the fact. But I do think it'd be a great model for ACOs. There's been a lot of interest among physicians, especially the physician-led ACOs, the ones that are not hospital-based. But again, for them to be successful, and I think they can be successful, they do need at this point at least to collaborate with hospitals to provide uh, hospital home care. You need that partnership right now. Great. To what extent, if any, do your doctors and hospitals object to serving patients at homes in dangerous parts of town? Is that a problem and how do you deal with it? Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's an issue that um, it often gets raised. I think it's an appropriate issue to bring up. Um, our experience in providing home-based primary care uh, in Baltimore, which you know has, has areas that are not the safest, is that you know, our, our healthcare professionals do okay. They usually are not targets. Um, you know, escorts can be provided. Um, so I think it's useful and prudent to have those kinds of concerns, but, uh, and to plan for those things, but it, it doesn't, on a practical level, it doesn't usually present a problem, a true problem. This is an interesting question. Is it harder or easier to protect patient privacy when you when you care for 
them at home? What about the curious next door neighbor, for example, the neighbor seeing the docs and nurses coming and going or delivery of oxygen or, or the like, would that not permit the neighbor to put two and two together? Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, you know, just having come off an inpatient attending uh, shift in our hospital, there are relatively few private beds. Most most rooms are two bedrooms. So, you know, in that context, and, and you know, recent relatives who are ill in the hospital, like if you're in a room with more than you just just yourself, you have no privacy at all. You know, every sound, every smell, every utterance is is heard by everyone uh, in that room. Uh, you know, the nosy neighbor phenomenon. You know, potentially a true thing, but um, you know, I think you do have more privacy in the context of your own home. I think you have more autonomy uh, when you're cared for at home and being able to do the things that you want. You certainly have a better ability to move around. And there have been studies of hospital at home that show, you know, where they put accelerometers on people being taken care of at home and in the hospital. And when you're at home, you move around a whole lot more, get out of bed a whole lot more. Um, so I think, um, despite the nosy neighbor, maybe knowing something is going on, they're not going to know the particulars of your illness or what your sodium is running that day, which I think does not happen in the typical acute care hospital, unless you're in a private room. And even when you're in a private room, everyone's always barging into your room at all hours of the day and night anyway. Um, so I, I think it's, uh, you know, that becomes a risk benefit choice kind of thing. So here's an interesting take. Joint Commission sends teams to conventional hospitals. Will the Joint Commission of the future send people into patients' homes? What if the patient objects? Yeah, I guess the patient could object and the Joint Commission will have to go on to the next patient that, uh, that the program could help them survey. But yeah, if this, if this, as this model scales, Joint Commission will, will, will be getting involved. I'm reasonably sure of that. And they'll figure something out. You know, I think the idea is to um, you know, the hospital does some things really well. They absolutely do. And hospitals are absolutely necessary. I don't think anyone who's involved in hospital at home would, is such a Luddite that they would say that hospitals are not a needed thing. Uh, and there are some great things. Hospitals do some things really, really well. I think hospital at home does some things really, really well. So any kind of regulatory or accreditation should try and borrow best from both and combine them into a new better. And, and I think that should be a guiding principle for those kinds of questions that come up. Yeah, so hospitals have become a form of specialty. Will doctors focusing on hospital at home do the same? Yeah, I don't think, um, in my own view, it's, it's really interesting. We've been trying to do some writing on this. You know, the current folks who do hospital at home care, they, you know, many of them have, have trained themselves or have been trained kind of on the job. I think in the future, you'll see more intentional training, the development of competencies and curricula and training programs. You know, should it be its own specialty? I don't, I don't know. I think that's a question still up for grabs. I think to the extent, uh, you know, currently many hospital at homes have been directed more at older adults than younger adults. I don't think that has to happen. I think everyone could benefit by being taken care of at home. And as the model scales, I think more and more people will. Um, so I, I don't know if it becomes sort of the way, you know, think about hospital medicine in the context of internal medicine. It's a field of special focus. It's not its own true subspecialty. Uh, and, you know, in the way that boards are defined and accredited, you know, uh, you know, boards of the American Board of Internal Medicine or other boards are defined. Uh, hospital medicine still comes under their purview. So I, I think that you may end up seeing something like that, but I think it'll depend a little bit on how the field evolves. I think, uh, you know, my own bias is, you know, not to yet split off another church, but to somehow, you know, bring it in under the larger umbrella of, of, of internal medicine or, or how the field moves forward. I think this is our last question. Do you see any likelihood that in states with certificates of public need will impose something analogous to COPNs on hospital at home? It's possible. That I, I don't know. It is possible. I mean, my preference would be to have them adopt the federal standards if, if those are meet their standards. But, you know, states, uh, state prerogatives are hard to predict. Great. 
And we have a comment in the chat box. I would like to see the cat if the kitty's willing to make an appearance. And two, uh, there is actually one more question. What about medications and IV drugs? Would that be provided from retail pharmacy or inpatient pharmacy? Yes and yes and yes. And if you want to hear the answer to that, and if, if your meeting ends early, there's the Hospital at Home Users Group, which I mentioned before, is having a webinar on pharmacy and medication uh, issues at four o'clock today. <laughs> I don't want to compete, but... It'll be Fantastic. online recorded, so you can come watch our recorded version. Don't don't miss the conference here. And we are right at the end of our session, so thank you so much Great. for sharing this your wealth terrific. of Thanks knowledge. Thanks for having me. The, amazing. Um, thank you all for joining us, and please visit the exhibit hall or our poster sessions that are all uh, happening next after this. And thanks again. Great.